Did it would is this so hi everyone is there someone who would like to read uh, the Pelin Credo? I don't mind. <laughs> okay, okay, please. Yeah. Say. Sure, go ahead. Um, so, just, say, uh, just say just say your name first for the people who are listening, not watching. Right. Hi there, everybody. I'm Clara Goldie. I'm based in the UK, and Mary introduced me last week, so it's uh, exciting to be here again this week. <laughs> Um, so the Pelin Credo ground rules for the Peter Fleming Forum. The ground rules in the Pelin Credo are designed to support a safe and nourishing environment. And one, we ask that you come to the meeting with a clear, free head, sorry, a, a clear head free of the influence of drink and drugs. Two, in any, any uh -oh. um, uh, uh, Clara, I think you're, I'm not sure if it's my connection. Are uh, people having trouble hearing the three days? Yes, yes. 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 I think okay. she's freezing. Okay. Cla ah, Clara? I yes, I can hear you're, you. Yeah, you, we can't hear you, darling. The, oh. the internet's bad. I moved. Okay, yeah. try again, so, try again. So, um, shall I do two again or three again? Oh no, <laughs> definitely start at two, please. We didn't hear it. <laughs> oh, didn't you? Oh dear. No. <laughs> quick, quick, quick suggestion I have, and I don't know if this is true. Uh, I don't have much experience with, with uh, Zoom, but I, someone told me the other day that if everybody has their, is not muted, if they're not muted, that the person speaking might get garbled. So I don't know if other people should be muting while we're listening. Right. Oh, that's yeah. a good idea. Okay, so if everybody mutes, maybe even turn the video off, uh, that could help. So number two, in any Pelin setting, you keep control of the pace and depth of your work. You may pass or say no to any suggestion. Your no will be accepted and not judged or analyzed. No means no. Number three, even though the meetings are recorded, we ask that people respect the confidentiality of those present and do not share anything they heard outside the meeting. Number four, in Pelin work, we have a strict no gossip rule. No gossip means we do not talk about anyone who is not pre present, even in a pleasant way. Okay, that's, that's the rules, everybody. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Clara. Um, Welcome. <laughs> Peter uh, will call on us. Will, will uh, call on us to say uh, our name and our geographical location. That's the other way we start the meeting. <clears throat> Un unmute yourself, Peter. <laughs> An occupational hazard of these meetings. Yeah. I'm Peter. And I'm uh, in Kings Lynn in Norfolk in England. Mary Gulliman? Uh, I'm Mary Gulliman. I live in Topanga, California, just outside Los Angeles, but I'm currently in Ro sheltering at home in Rosarito Beach, Mexico. Okay, Nikki? Hi, I'm Nikki. I'm in Wimbledon, London, England. Right, Clara? Yep. Hi, everybody. I'm Clara Goldie. I'm based in the UK in Somerset. Okay. Cease. I'm Cecilia Yoakum. Go by Cease in Tampa, Florida, US. Cynthia. I'm Cynthia. Um, I am in Kankakee, Illinois, which is about 40 minutes south of Chicago. Mary. Mary Stapleton? She needs to unmute. Yeah, she's, you're not unmuted, right. Mary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mary Stapleton. I'm in Eastbourne on the south coast of England. Okay. Um, Cynthia? 
Oh. I already went. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. The names move around. I'm going down a list of names and then <laughs> Okay, I'll get it. Victor. Uh, Here, I tell everybody else to unmute and mute. I didn't know what I was doing. So I'm uh, Vic Flagg, F-L-A-G-G. -G. I'm in Abbotsford, British Columbia, which is about uh, an hour and 50 minutes out of Vancouver. And uh, as somebody just has already mentioned, I knew David Pellin and, and Peter in 6970. Thank you. Um, Stacy? I'm Stacy. I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada. Victoria? Um, I'm Victoria. I am PPP, Pellin Project Paris in France. Um, right. If I, if I covered everybody, has everyone not spoken? Everyone's spoken, I think so. Clara. Um, yeah. I don't think you got Clara. Oh, uh, Clara? No. Oh, did yeah, she did yeah. Somerset. Yeah, let me let me just tell you. Anyway, let me not worry about a whole lot of stuff. Let me just go on. Um, uh, what, Peter, I just want to do one technical thing. I muted yeah, sure. everybody, including Nikki. If uh, uh, if you call on Nikki and she doesn't remember how to unmute herself, I will unmute her for you. But just to keep the okay. interference down, okay? Okay. So, thank you very, very much for coming. Um, yeah, it's a very, very big one for me with Victor here, there's no doubt. Um, what, I'm, what we talked about last week is what we call the Pellin Life Forces. And it's this little gadget which is moving... Um, uh, moving cardboard circles, okay? It is absolutely uh, David Pellin material that uh, I have adapted to make it easier to teach and easier to read. But um, so we have some different words than um, people who studied with me a long time ago like Cease, New, and Victor, who studied with David at the same time as me, New. Um, so we talked about the three life forces last week, just go over them. What we call performance, which is about risk-taking creativity. David used to call it vanity. Um, I taught it first in those words, uh, as Cease knows. Uh, then we have the yellow part of our life, which is the caring life force, um, which Dave taught as rejectiveness. And then we have the green cardboard circle, which we call the material life force. Dave called it hostility. Um, another time we'll look at the relationship between his words and my words. Um, yeah, the, the total originality of um, this particular stuff is his, the particular adaptions, because one of the reasons we use this is I want people to be able to grab this material quickly. And that's part of what I'm calling recently the Pellon Lift. And the Pellon Lift is about getting the material together, the Pellon tools together, so people can grab them and use them rather quickly um, in these tragic and uh, times. Um, in which we live. Uh, that the Pellon lift is sort of our contribution, uh, we hope, uh, to mental health issues that are come, gonna come up all over the place. Anyway, me trying to be a bit tight with the teaching. So we introduced the three of them last week. Um, what I 
want to uh, do over this session and the next two sessions, <coughs> which will be Wednesday and a week from now, is go into each of them in depth, okay? Um, just for anyone who's new, um, I do very brief, very precise, totally clear teaching within eight min, eight and a half minutes, and then we have a discussion. Um, that's a dumb joke, and Nikki doesn't like my dumb jokes. Um, yeah, so I usually introduce the material in maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then we have a discussion about it, or particular people have something they want to say. Um, that's the way it goes. As I said, Dave, Dave called it what we call the material. What I call a material life force, he called them motivating forces. He said these forces motivate us into being who we are. Um, even though I have changed some of David's words, just for you know, people who go way back, what David called referrals, I call, as I've taught here, memory links because it's simply easier to teach and a whole lot of people didn't like the word, the, his use of the word referral because it meant something else in the, so often in the helping professions. I, I think I can say, and I, I think here, this is a place where <coughs> I can talk for Mary, probably as well as myself, uh, some of the, I, I prefer his words. Uh, he sort of grabbed something that was so different and so original. But, you know, I, over the years I had these different criticisms and I, I just made it smoother. Uh, I've, I've made David's material smoother. And I think to some extent there's a huge, I, I'm proud of that achievement. It's very accessible. <coughs> you know, we can keep developing it so um so you can teach it to kids um but there's been a, a certain loss in power um moving away from his words i feel like um anyway i want to go today and over the next two sessions i want to go into each of these life forces in some depth and in a way this will be the first time in these forums and i i think we're up to about 12 if i'm right um where we've really gone into something in depth a lot of a lot of this has been <clears throat> i don't want to i don't want to dismiss it at all but you know i've used the word broad brush uh, and when i taught the life forces last week you know i i had the broad brush the caring life forces love the material life forces money and the performance life force of creativity that's sort of trying to create what i call almost graspability so someone can just grasp it the study of it the depth of it the subtlety of it is is a lifelong study um, I have no doubt about that. Um, anyway, to go in, so we're going to go into each of these life forces with some depth. Uh, but given that today I'm just talking about one and there are three. The material life force is the part of us that needs to be competent um, around the material, physical and financial world. As I said last week, starting at the beginning of life, the material life force is the small child on the mother's breast, the physicality of it. The material life force is even before that, it's the unborn baby being in the mother's womb. You know, maybe that's the epitome of a performance life force. Maybe that is the most 
secure place we ever are. Um, as, and this is, I know, repeating last week's work, but in Pelham training, there's always a lot of repetition because um, we believe in that. Um, just to touch on that without making it a big digression, the whole methodological approach of Pelham is tools. And you only, so there's no answers in it. There's no answers in the material. And that's why I've taken a slightly different direction picture than David. Um, I talk about tools. No, there's nothing in a tool. No, there's no masterpiece of sculpture or, or a set of bookshelves. Um, it's what someone does with the tools. Um, and in this case, it's understanding this tool so we can solve problems and move our own and other people's lives ahead. Our aim. The baby has the security of mother's breast. The toddler has the physical security um, of being around familiar people and familiar objects. But the toddler also can have a blankie or a teddy or a uh, Ellie, in terms of my grandkids, um, that is a comfort, you know, a comfort object. Um, and if we remember back, back when we were parents, you know, when Ellie cannot be found, the trouble, uh, when the comfort object of the small child cannot be found, it's very difficult. Um, the older child has toys, a certain sense of possession of their bedroom. You know, this is my room. You know, if you come in, Bobby will shoot you. Um, the older child having a phone. My grandson has just got a phone. Um, my grandson in England. Um, so the teenager having the right sneakers, uh, the right trainers, um, the older teenager having a car, um, you know, moving in, moving out of home and having your own room or apartment. That's material life force. Um, you know, having a job, making money, getting a mortgage, paying the mortgage, um, that's all material life force. It's the part of life that enables us to be financially secure, um, that to be organized, to have all the papers in the right place and never running out of soap or toothpaste and having stuff in the freezer. That's all material life force. Um, one of the things and one of the this part of the work one of david's pellant particular creativities in my view he created a school of thought of practice in which there's a place for money and it's not as if oh you're into money but you're not into therapy so you're not as authentic as i am because i'm in touch with my emotions with David's work, and as I've developed it into this, uh, it's not a pyramid. You know, there's not something on top. And this is where I, and with the material life force, we make a very big difference from things like Maslow, where there's a hierarchy of needs and what is on top is being authentic, which sort of means being a therapist, okay? <laughs> and what we're saying is, no, human nature is more varied than that. So, you know, we, we have respect for people who are good with money, who've made a lot of money. Um, you know, the judgments we come in, come in from a different place, but they don't come in because they're into being bank managers or engineers or computer programmers, but they're not really quite in touch with their feelings. 
which is the caring life force, they're not really creative, which is the performance life force. And what we're saying is material life force is food, clothing, and shelter. It's our basic survival. You know, the people, the minds, the people, the organizations that are going to put the world together when we, if and when we come out of this and the disruption of 20% unemployment plus, um, they're going to be people who, in terms of what we call the interlocking circles, the best of those people, which in a sense, we are looking to, to save our families, communities, and countries, they're going to have a configuration that's something like that, okay? They'll have a great deal of material life force. They'll be, uh, well, it's happening right now. It's happening right now. You know, we're all dependent on them of, you know, coming out with the numbers, coming out with the graphs, um, coming out with the predictions. And that's all. And I guess some of the people on, some of the best of the people on television at the moment, you can see that this works. When I talk about practicing with the Pelon tools, one of the ways to do it is watch people on television. You know, Dr. Fauci is absolutely this. You know, on one level, because there's a lot of hardness in the material life force. And if he was a scientist that wasn't of the absolutely top rank his configuration would be like that okay the caring life force is squeezed out and i'm just a scientist and you know i won't relate to you in any other way but being a scientist but you know dr fauci has that heavy segment of caring life force that everybody can feel. Uh, he's the person in America who is the senior and most effective spokesperson on television about the coronavirus. Um, he's got to have some performance life force because that's where the confidence and creativity come from. I mean, it's the performance life force which enables him to stand up to his boss the president of the united states and you can see the other lady there who's got a, a stellar reputation and she's sort of folding under her boss's influence she doesn't have enough performance life force that that's the way these work together um but there's no doubt and I think Dr. Fauci's probably got almost something more like that. He has got enough performance life force, which is confidence, political savvy, ability to take risk, ability to stand up to people. He's got enough of that that he's his own person there. There's no question. Okay, if you want to fire me, fire me. Um, you know, you'll pay a price. That's performance life force. Coming back to material life force, material life force in some ways is a, is a bit cold um, because it's people in the material life force on one level aren't that much concerned about emotions and they can be sort of bored with them. Um, and as I said on last Wednesday, uh, one, one of the applications of this tool is in relationships and marriages. Because if someone's got a lot of performance life force and they're ambitious, they want a new home, they want a promotion, 
um, yeah, they want to be there. You know, the woman who, okay, I'll put on a good Thanksgiving dinner. I know how to do that. But, you know, I am running for Congress. Um, or I am going to get, that will be more performance life force. You know, I'm going to get a promotion in my um, hedge fund company. In fact, I might start my own hedge fund company. I'll still put on the Thanksgiving dinner, but there's a certain sort of coldness there. That person can be uh, a good wife, to use a phrase, um, but there'll, there'll be a bit of distance. There's a way that money, the property, uh, the house, the private plane, they're in some way going to be quite prominent. It's not fair to say they come first, but they are very, very prominent and times, to be factual, they will come first. But that's a valid life. But if that very ambitious woman is married to a man who's got tons of caring life force, works as a general practitioner, um, and wants to talk about, wants to come home and talk about the, what the day was like, wants to come home and talk about the kids, wants to come home and talk about what was your day like, uh, wants to talk about emotional things that are going on him. Uh, and obviously I've deliberately switched because you'd usually say, you know, the man has a material life force and the woman has the caring life force. I've deliberately switched those roles because of our political values. Um, and, but they're equally true. Um, and in the material life force in that marriage, there could be real difficulties. Uh, and what we're saying is communicate Victor will, knows as well as I do, the thing that makes a marriage work is communication. Um, those two people need to communicate. Um, and people in the material life force are not always good at communicating. Sometimes they can be lousy at communicating, or putting it frankly. Um, and that can affect someone being a parent. Uh, the hypothetical example I used, uh, her kids. Mum was always cold. I can, hardly, I can hardly remember the number of times she gave me a hug. Um, you know, that's material life force. That's what, that's what it's like. I'll stop. And if people have got things they want to say about it. Yeah, Mary. Mute. Sometimes I can't see my cursor. Yeah, no, that last thing you said really um, fired me up because, uh, as you know, Peter, and some of the other people know, I've been in a, a business partnership with somebody for nearly three years. And I spent those three years banging my head against a wall because uh, it's so hard for her to communicate with me things that are essential that she should be communicating with me about the business, not just about our friendship. And um, she is, she's very like my husband, who was also primarily performance with a lot of material life force. He was a film director who could not go over budget and cope with 30,000 extras. And, you know, he, he had an amazing material life force that married beautifully with his artistic creativity. And she was in the, in the uh, television arts and is now created this amazing business plan. So they're both, both them, uh, my friend Jody and my husband were all, almost all material and performance life force, but with a care, caring life force that cared about very deeply about the people that were close, about family and friends. But it, it doesn't extend further than that. And unfortunately, it doesn't extend to being able to see it, see my difficulties around her lack of communication from my point of view. Like I can project myself into someone whose views and things are completely different from mine. I can turn my head around and think about what their worldview is like and what their feelings are like. And even after three years of 
bash, bash, bash. Why can't you understand this? I mean, I do try to change my tactics now, but that's how it started out. Um, she can't get it from my point of view. And she can just occasionally now, after nearly three years, with a hugely long attempt on my part, and then she'll go, oh. <laughs> anyway, sorry that was a bit long, but I was a bit fired up, uh, you saying that about they're not very good at communication. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The way we do this, because I'm very, very new to this, by the way, for, you know, I've only been doing it, you know, six weeks and um, but I'm getting more comfortable um, but the way we do it at the moment I call on people to say so I mean unless someone wants to wave their hand um, yeah do you want to say something Victoria um, yes um, I'm wondering if for example I know my strengths which is caring life force, and I need some of performance life force. How do I can bring in balance the material life force, which I know I possess, but in a, uh, how on this interlocking circles, well, they, they present me, is it just like tools are just naming it and seeing it, or somehow by knowing what they're about, yeah. I, can, I can help it. That's my question more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's something I want to address because after all these years and, you know, as I've said before, but, um, you know, 15th of June 2022 will be the 50th anniversary of the Palin Institute, okay? Um, and the reason I put that in, I've been around a long time, and even now I'm working on what is the methodology, okay? Like, how do you use it? Uh, and I still struggle with that a bit. So we talk about tools. The way I see it now, I'm using the word grasp. So you sort of grasp it. You grasp the material life force, okay? And you get a feel for it. And that was something David had. When I got the National Film Board of Canada to make the film about David, I sold it to them and Victor will totally understand this. I told it, I told it to them on the basis that this was an emotional teacher. You know, I had, I had better words than that. You know, he was a teacher who sort of taught with his full person and, and in a sense touched people on an emotional level. Um, and that's what a lot of this works about. And, you know, we all know that that's what Pelham is. That, so I think it's touching the tool, grasping the tool, using it, and then finding small things you could do about it. Because w the, when you asked your question, Victoria, my first response, you're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> I mean, people, you know, and other people who know me, you know, material life is not my strength. Um, so say, so, hey, you know, but no, what you can do, what I could do is, okay, I've got those pile of papers over there. If I need to get into my material life force, if it's squeezed, okay, I could file that pile of papers. You know, I could really work out where my bank account stands, okay? I could work out a way that even with everything that's going on, I could get someone to come here and fix some of the glitches um, with both my computer and my heating system, which I need, which is too hot, okay? Um, you know, so, so you look for sort of small things to do that are in that particular life force. When we get to the others over in the next two weeks, there'll be similar small things in carrying life force, small things in performance life force. And then almost sort of feel, what's this like? And then it's sort of putting aside the other stuff. You know, putting aside how much time you want to put into the kids, you know, putting aside that you absolutely want to try something new that's exciting, performance. And just saying, okay, I'm just going to concentrate 
on my material life force and see if I can expand it. That makes sense. Do you want to say anything, Stacy? Nope, I'm falling asleep. I'm going to leave and, and catch this on YouTube. I didn't okay. sleep last night. Bye. Oh, okay. Johnny good, Stacy. Okay. Bye bye. Yeah, thanks for coming, Stacy. Thanks. Nikki? Uh, excuse me, Peter. Cease has a hand up. Oh, sorry, Cease. Um, well, what you're talking about makes me, I've been studying psychodrama for a long time that has some gestalt features to it, but one of the things that we use is a future projection. So we have a person, like you would have a person stand where they are right now with the wheel, what, how is that divided up right now in their life? And then uh, talk about that and then uh, imagine a place like you have a line almost. You're now and you walk up there. It's now, I don't know, let's say 15 years from now. What do you want that wheel to look at now? What are the different needs you have at this point? And I'm thinking especially like people my age who are retiring at this point where you know, when I was young, money didn't have the um, uh, the need, <laughs> you know, I could do anything, you know. So, um, but now um, I'm retiring and I'm sure this is true for a lot of people like myself who were kind of a hippie. What are we, how are we going to um, balance our life then? Um, and how, where would that, uh, money triangle um, be and, and how should we uh, prepare for it now by going back to where we are now just and thinking about the steps we almost walk people through the steps that as they get to that point what are they doing to make those changes and somebody is usually writing it down for them so mm. But they start with the future projection to look at what do I want my life to be like 15 years from now? What, what would that circle be like then? Yeah, I think, I think that's, you know, I, I think that's because um, I've used um, sort of time, a particular, I've not used it for so long, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a particular thing out of time management, which is, looking at life from different perspectives. And I think that's one of the ways for people and then the, to look at what their goals are in six months, two years, 15 years, or end of life. That was the um, particular thing I used. And I think it sort of acting out that, um, you know, your background psychodrama can, yeah, really help. And I guess that would be acting out financial needs or financial aspirations or wanting to leave stuff for kids or uh, younger generations, uh, you know, or my generation, you know, how are we going to get the kids or the grandkids to college? Um, and I guess that's where the, I think these tools can be useful because we have to have the cold reality of the material life force because that's what the material life force is material life force is the cold reality and i guess it is a totally chilling i almost want to say it in a gentle way that we live with a reality of that with the cold projection of how many people are going to die you know that that's new but it, this makes it work. So in a sense, um, uh, you know, this can be very steadying. And I think it's true because Dr. Fauci is very steadying. I think for millions of Americans, you know, he is very steadying. He's telling us what the reality is. And I, then I guess there's something similar and almost acting some of that out. I'm remembering that <clears throat> one of the participants in an earlier forum, when we were talking about the deaths, she said um, that she, 
as she was a bookkeeper and her life was kind of numbers, she could look at the numbers of deaths without getting upset, mm. which is a very material. I'm not criticizing yeah. it in any way. I'm just, no, uh, no. as a teaching point, it's a very material life force response, yeah. right? Yep. And if you're going to be a really good bookkeeper, you're going to have to have a lot of, lot of material life force. Otherwise, you won't do the job well. It's that simple. You'll get interested in your clients. I mean, I want the bank manager to like me, okay? And particularly, in, and that was going back years. Now it's not even there. And it's irrelevant whether the bank manager likes me or not. He wants to see the figures. Um, Nikki, do you want to say anything? Cynthia does, Peter. Cynthia, sorry. Hi, yes. Um, well, I was thinking of a, of a couple of things, but one of, um, you know, a while back, uh, I'm not anymore, I haven't been for uh, like seven years now, but I used to be a divorce lawyer. Um, I think I got out of it when my caring life force started awaking and I couldn't handle it anymore. Um, but one of the things that I noticed that couples did, and I, in fact, I used to even kind of joke about it, was is, is that in almost every case, one of the parties was much stronger in the material life form than, force than the other. And I, mean, I used to joke about, you know, depending on who, who came in, you know, be the person who came in, you know, when, when they asked for the financials, they would have this nice organized, you know, their bank statements, they would fill everything out. And you had the one without the material life force. And, you know, you may get a stack of things and he might not even know where the bank accounts are <laughs> and, you know, and it would never fail and it, it almost never failed that and I wonder if couples do that too they sort of start assigning the life forces to each other or they just get together that way I don't know but it would almost always be the case that there'd be somebody who would be you know and, and, and actually I tended to prefer the person with the normal well, actually, no, because then they would criticize everything if you didn't have everything. But the one without it, it would be like this headache of big stacks of papers that, you know, a box of, if, if they gave you anything at all. <laughs> so. You know, we have a basic concept in Pellon, and this is mine, not David's, called transparency. So I'm, what I want to say to you almost is, stop talking about me, okay? I've had four... <laughs> I'm sorry. I've had four, that's a joke. Um, sorry, Nikki. Um, I've had four divorces and I'm the client who doesn't have the material life force and doesn't have all the papers together. So I, I, did, I did feel that, okay. So yeah, that's very true. And it leads to divorce as well. Um, you know, because people don't understand each other. So, uh, Peter, thank um, you, thank you for bringing that up. Because, um, yeah, it's useful for me. Yeah, this goes back to day one. Okay, this goes back to absolutely the first. Um, and I'll re review that material another time. But this goes back to the first forum we did, which is on contribution from hurt. Okay. So, you know, you're contributing from me, I'm contributing back, because there's an openness there. Um, and maybe it's a bit healthy, I can make a joke about it now. Uh, <laughs> oh dear. Uh, that might be, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, and you're totally accurate. I mean, I could, when you were describing that, I thought, you're talking about me. Uh, Peter, Victor's trying to say something. Yeah, Victor, please. Well, thank you. I'm. Uh rocked <laughs> by all of this. I'm so uh, blown away by this. Uh, appreciate the humor, uh, um, Peter. I'm on my I'm on my second, not you know, so my second marriage. So I relate to everything that's been said and and what uh, Cynthia said there. Uh, but I want to go back, if I could, just to uh, what Victoria said because something I just saw something. You'll appreciate that I haven't studied all of uh, Peter's material prior to this when he started arcing the three life forces i wasn't too sure and then i heard hostility ha ha and i still remember pelham's yeah. terms right and so because i'm yeah. a, i'm a rejective here we go so yeah, uh exactly me too so what, what's yeah yeah 
So what oh, yeah, absolutely. I want to go back to something. <laughs> and um, what I go back to what uh, Victoria said, because I just saw an exchange there between Victoria and, 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 and Peter's answer that I think is really significant. I want to share that with you and then and say something about David that I remember now. But Victoria asked the question, um, you know, how do you, how do you focus, uh, since you've got these uh, three different forces and you know you're, say, too much in one and not enough in another, how do you develop in the other one? And I thought, well, that's really interesting because that could be applied to Myers-Briggs or all kinds of other things. How do you develop in the other area when you are, you know, so strongly in the one? And, and to be honest with you, um, you know, I, this is, I'm on my second marriage and right now I've got a crisis with one of my kids and, and they're all telling me, you know, how dominant I was and all these things I did. And I think, yep. And, uh, but then, and then Peter, you said something very interesting because you said, um, either referring to David or uh, just Pelinism, I guess. Pelin was an emotional teacher. And you're answering Victoria's question. How do you, how do you develop in the other area? And I, and I broadly, that's a big important question because, uh, I, I, I took some training in Myers-Briggs and then years later I think, yeah, I'm still that person. I, I haven't developed the other, right? How do you do that? And then your question was, or your answer was, Pelham was an emotional teacher. He touched you, that's what you said, and then you find a small thing to, to do. And that is so significant because when we feel the challenge is huge, after all, how do you change your personality? It gets discouraging, right? And and so you said that, and that was really interesting. And just to put a real personal touch on that, you, you said you find a small thing to do in that particular life force where you want to develop yourself. And that's really significant. If you give somebody something big, it's too hard, right? And so, again, please forgive me. And some of the other new people here don't know that I was with Pellin in, uh, and Peter in 69. So if I get a bit choked up, you'll forgive me. I'm really touched by this. And I'm going through a lot of my life right now. But... I remember walking into the activator unit and there's this man and I'm talking about Peter saying how he touched you. There's this man who said, I will kiss the boots of any man, but when I know what he knows, I'll keep on going. Whoa, there I was, you know, and I, there's this man with this life force, this energy, this powerful energy. And boy, did I need it. I was all strung out on drugs. I was all messed up. Actually, I'd been away from drugs for a while, but I was still really messed up. And here's this person touching you. And, and I told about the chest story, Peter, how they used, how I used the chest for to some of the others here before they, everybody got on. And so the big thing was, boy, did he ever touch me. And then, as Peter said, you find a small thing to do in the area where you need to develop. And that's what... The genius that David, David Pellin was for me now, and Peter's helped me see this even more, is that he touched you. Boy, did he ever touch you. We're talking about, wham, did he ever, he had, that, he had energy. He had a spiritual energy. I call it that. You know, people around the activity room say, rah, 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 but, you know, now, 40 years later, it was, that's what it was, right? And it was his version. And he touched you, and then the genius of it was find something small to do in the area you need to develop it because then and this was the miracle of the activator unit there was this growth taking place all over the place change faces every day every week people coming in off the street with a new buzz and there was this incredible thing going on peter knows what i'm talking about it was miracle almost how did he do it i think you just touched on it peter when you said you know first he touched you he gave you something of your energy and then the genius was he helped you find something small because you're all messed up, <laughs> something small in the area you need to develop. And he helped you know what that area was. I remember him saying a couple of raw things to me that were really hard to hear, but yeah. in, in a beautiful way and in a context where, where all your friends can help you grow and develop. So, so I wanted to touch on that, and, and forgive me if I get a bit emotional here or take up too much time, but I'm really deeply touched by, by this experience, and uh, Peter, thank you so much for this opportunity, so uh, I'll shut up now, but thank you. Um, this, is, this is amazing to me to bring back the memory of David Pellin, who changed my life uh, in, in amazing ways. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Can I just yeah. say for people watching, I uh, don't know if everyone knows, but there's the film Activator One on the website. 
And in that film is a section that touches just on what Victor said, a suicidal student who barely says anything. And David Pellin sees, I imagine, that he needs to develop his performance life force a bit. And um, he gives him a very small task. Yes. And the guy comes back and does it the next week. Yeah. And so it's a really good example, a good, you know, maybe seven minutes of the film, yeah. but um, it's really worth watching as an illustration of what Victor just described. I think it's the hydrogen atom, isn't it? Yeah. What do you mean, Peter? Oh, that was the task. Oh, was it that was the task to teach about that? I only remembered he had to teach a little something. Yeah. That was right. Okay. Thank you. I, I will, I'll find the place in the film and I'll email uh, people in case they're interested in seeing it. I'll you. give you the timing of it. Okay, Mary. Stapleton, do you want to say something? Um, yes, I am retired now for six years from a, being a social worker in a drug and alcohol team. Um, and I feel I felt very lost in the beginning of retiring. I, I didn't know what to do, who to care for anymore. Um, and I did some voluntary work at a, a local drug and alcohol team here in Eastbourne. Um, but since then, I I feel like I've been in retreat from my caring life force, and I feel that the material life force is the one that has started to work for me um mm. i hadn't realized it until now listening to you yeah no and that's one of it, the yeah ways. It's, it's explained Sorry. something to me as to what's happened to where my energy has gone um yeah. and that it's all right for it to have changed i think yeah. that that's yeah. the, the important bit um yeah, yeah. And, and i'm really and now Having thought this through, I'm really looking forward to getting back out there away from lockdown and developing more of, of the performance side and mm. of the material life yeah. force. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, um, and I think that's one of the ways that um, the life forces work and, and certainly it's, not the part of the work today, but um, and going back to Victor and um, I guess the just the sheer inspiration of the man. If it wasn't for Dave's material, I think I'd, you know, be nice to build a boat or <laughs> you know do something very very different. Uh, be fun, uh, but no. You know, uh, but you know, you can burn out in the caring life force professions and you've got to be careful of them. Before I met David, just to say it, and this is relevant because I've got a lot of caring life force, okay, and I need outlet for it. But I was working in prison work. <sighs> that was it. Uh, you know, I, I, I could hardly, go, at a certain point, I could hardly go back in. I'm seeing one guy, what the hell difference does that make? You know, every, all the hurt that was in that place, a place called Ocala. Um, I, was not, I worked at another prison as well. Um, and I met him and I learned about the life forces and I needed some work that was in the caring life force, but I needed to move away from prisons. No. Uh, so it's just sort of interesting. There the particular ways these tools can work. Anyway, I want to be careful. I you remember we the teaching I did on the pendulum? Okay. Now, you know, I, I, I've been doing this work a long time, so you know, I can fake it. You know, because Victor's here, my pendulum is off the chart, okay, <laughs> totally off the chart. <laughs> Do you want to say something, Nikki? 
having had a hard afternoon. I, I got I to gotta say something, because you know, it brings back so much memories. I remember being in the unit, but, and my emotions were like wrecked. I was had been strung out on marijuana and hashish and everything else, and and uh, and I, uh, not everybody was here when I told this little story, but when I first got in there, uh, my back was, I was sitting on the cushion, my back was up against the wall, and later on, when I went out, I found that my gums are bleeding because I've been grinding my teeth so hard. That's how scared I was, right? So talk about the uh, pendulum, you know, I know. And um, and I remember, I remember David saying, and I can't remember the exact words, but pretty close, he says, he says, around here, most of the people, including the ring holders, you don't actually believe the, the pendulum, but it exists, he said. You don't, he says, you get high, you're going to get low. And he said, some people around here don't actually believe me, or something like that. Uh, Peter might remember more clearly, but, but David knew that the pendulum was one of the hardest things for people to grasp. And he said, you get high, you're going to get low, right? And, uh, and I remember that very distinctly. So, uh, Peter, what you said there touched me. Okay, thank you. Nikki, do you want to say something? Yeah, well... After a hard afternoon? Yeah. Well, mostly I just want to say, um, it's not about the material life force. It's just so amazing to me to hear Victor. <laughs> you know, just someone who was there then. You know, this person that Peter has always talked about and who's been long dead since before I ever first got involved. And it's like, well... And and long dead and in another country far away and <laughs> and Peter's done all these other things since and uh, just to sort of that's amazing to sort of <laughs> it's like some hand has reached back in time and plucked David Pellin himself the person you, you know and and sort of plopped him here there's this really live personal experience whereas I'm used to you know decades of Peter just talking about things he said and talk, teaching the material, you know, Peter being Peter about it. Um, and so now I'm hearing somebody totally else <laughs> being, uh, being David Perlin more directly, because I guess, I don't know what you've done, Victor, in all the years in between, but it's like, you're just, it's, it's so much like you're just going plonk back in time. It's really exciting. Anyway, I'm glad you showed up. Yeah. Shelley, thank you thank you very much. Thank you. I'm really uh, very emotional right now, and thank you all. Shelley, do you want to come in? Yeah, hi, I'm Shelley from Los Angeles, and I'm sorry I'm late. Um, I, I guess I'll try and catch up on YouTube what I missed, but um, you know, I was I was um, there on Wednesday, and. Uh, you know, and my life is as a therapist and, uh, you know, working with people and doing presentations and that kind of thing as well. It's really usually about the caring, though there is some performance. But, um, you know, when I was uh, a teenager and a young adult, I was um, an actress and studying acting. So it was all about performance, performance, performance. And then I had so many, um, I had depression and I had so many blows, um, you know, uh, working in Hollywood that I really changed and I said you know I need to find something that gives me a feeling of success and it's based on my talent or my um, intelligence sorry my intelligence versus my you know my looks so that's when I went back to school and got my degrees and um, became a therapist so then my life merged into more and more caring and I felt so like my you know sort of right brain you know caring self just keep getting larger and larger and then I became a mother. My son's now 20. And I think my life became more material that way, you know, because you have to do lots. And now there's three of us in the house. And it's, you know, lots of figuring out who's shopping, who's getting what, who's cooking, you know, who's cleaning. So that feels very material in that way. It does sort of flex and change, though. I would say material is usually my last thing. So I don't know if that's interesting to people, but, you know, I'm just kind of looking at that and wondering if I should make one of those dials for my clients or should I just have them draw it, you know, when I work with them. Uh, uh, can I just, can I just yes. say to Shelley, yes. um, 
if I eventually get home to Topanga, I have several of those sets of circles in my house. In Japan. I could probably even arrange for um for you to be able to pick one up as you only live about three miles from me. <laughs> yeah, I'm um, going back to this for a minute. Um, and as I've said here before, I, I think this is a fantastic and really powerful device. And it was in, invented by someone who was a student of mine. Um, she was the mother superior of a convent in, in a London, in Stockwell. Um, and she came up with this, it's, it's hers. Uh, I like it, and it's really powerful. I mean, you can take a whole lot of situations. I mean, you know, grab a current political situation or grab a current, say a sports person who's in trouble, you know, or a sports person who's achieving. Um, you know, if, if you look at this and, you know, the um, Bill Gates or the owner of Amazon, um, you know, we sort of, we can want them to be more responsible in some way, but they just got too much, you know, they got too much of a stunning, yeah, a stunningly successful combination for them of making money. You know, they're, they're not gonna have a soul. Um, you know, the soul comes from these two, performance or, they're gonna have all sorts of other things, you know. They are the reason we are doing this, right? They are the reason I am today in touch with Victor, which is extraordinary for both of us. And they're the reason, but they're probably not nice guys. And they probably teach their, probably treat their staff like dirt. And they might be cold parents. Now, you know, as I've said at other times, that's a broad brush stroke to help with the learning. But I might be on to something. You know, that might be a fairly accurate description of them. Um, and we respect them because we're looking at this. We're not saying we all should be the same. You know, they are the people who enabled us to be communicating with each other and learning from each other across these huge differences. Um, you know, I touched a lot uh, on Wednesday. Um, on the political part of this work. Um, and th this is me, okay? Th I, I just want to say this, and I want to say this with Victor here, because I didn't, I, I told hardly anybody about this for a long time. <clears throat> so bear with me and I'll time it and I'll try and keep it short. But it was in Vancouver, in British Columbia, now, if you want to raise money in Vancouver, you have a salmon bake, okay? <laughs> you know, because, you know, that is a country that has huge salmon. So we had a salmon bake and I was involved, other people were involved. And I had a really big fall. I'm embarrassed about this. I had a re really big falling out with David Pelham's <coughs> wife at the salmon bake. And I was pretty, I was young and bushy-tailed whatever and I went to Dave and I said I can't work with you anymore I'll study with you but I can't do the organizational stuff because all that happened and I pulled away from him because um, I didn't want to be a creep and be around and you know criticizing his wife he's a nice person but she and I were really like this um, yeah there's an end of this story that came up at the beginning of this session um, so you just got to bear with me on this. So I did, I pulled away a long way. I still studied with him, but it wasn't a big part of my life at all. And the date is very clear because it's in history and a date everybody knows. But I was driving to the prison I worked in and it came over the, and I was listening to the radio and the music was interrupted and it came and the announcement was made, Martin Luther King had been assassinated. 
and I was in America not when John Kennedy was campaigning for president. So it was Kennedy and then Dr. King. And I, I, I was just, you know, uh, like hit really hard. And it just came into my mind. David said, the only thing that matters is what you do. So I went to my work, well, and it was, you know, the, the date is clear. Um, it was the 4th of April, 1968. Uh, I went to prison, did my day's work, drove back to the unit and said to Dave, I'll work for you, any terms you want. Um, because when we'd had the split, he'd said, well, a captain can only have one ship. A ship can only have one captain. And I said, look, I'll work for you any way you want. We are all responsible. And his response was, okay, that's good. Now let me give you a lecture. We are not all responsible. I can't remember what it was. But then he'd give a lecture on something. Hold his finger up like this. Um, and he gave me a lecture on something. I mean, I had no idea that that would be my life's work. I had no idea that that would mean I'm here talking this. But, you know, the depth of commitment I made coming off that political tragedy. So, you know, the stuff I was talking about last week about, you know, race relations. And in my view, this is a particular time in history for young black women, uh, whether Afro-Caribbean here or Afro-American there. Um, yeah, big motivation, big link uh, between me and David Pell and then Martin Luther King. Um, I just want to tell the story. I mean, I won't try to do anything, but I, I need to tell the story. Does anyone want to say anything about the material life force? Um, can I just say, Peter, yeah. um, Clara had a digital hand up and for a moment she's lost connection but if she gets back on she was waiting to say yeah, something. that bit i haven't worked out no no it's fine don't, don't worry no don't, i don't mind me keeping track of who's waiting yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, i'm just saying if she gets back i just try and help her get yeah. back in she yeah. has something to say and anybody else want to say something on the material life force You can unmute yourself if you do. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to say something, Victoria? Well, um, I have a feeling what I really like today is when you said, well, material life force, it's also about the stock of the toothpaste and toilet paper and other things like more simple like uh, your bank accounts and everything and i thought oh it's all right i don't even have to start because i know to hold the family together that's my yeah. material life force yeah. and it's okay as long as i know that it's never been my strengths i i want to treat it with loving kindness to myself but just noticing well my material life force can be um well developed by doing things i i can do and i do also to to support life <laughs> and it's material life also the life of the family and all those things because i mm, i really liked it the way like from the broad broad brush it came to this uh simple human things and then what i'm wondering is like when you were presenting it in a broad brush you said it's money and you said that david uh was calling it hostility so why is it hostility? That's my question. Well, yeah, and th really thank you for bringing that up because I, I wanted to touch on that. If our caring life force is not looked after, we become hostile, okay? Material. Yeah, yeah sorry. Material. Yeah, my mistake. Yeah, if our material life force is not looked after, we become hostile we become angry, we become irritated. It's like, if we have a lot of material life force and we've got a new car, we will have a nice car. I don't have a car. I live here and I don't even have a car. 
uh, of my squeezed out material life force. Um, but if someone's got a lot of material life force, they'll have a nice car. And okay, they, they come back to where they parked it on the street and there's a big scrape, you know, there's a big dent in the car. They will be angry. Another way, very fundamental, so there's a certain hostility underneath the need for material, because in a sense, the best way to define material life force, not the brush stroke of last week, uh, I mean Wednesday, it is the need for physical and material security and comfort. If you want to understand what the material life force is about, go and have a look inside the first class lounge of an airline, okay? And there'll be all these people sitting here, sitting there, particularly the men, they'll sort of look like babies who've been bathed, fed, you know, they've got all this comfort around them, okay? And in a sense, if we take the hostility, so there is this sort of, and, and, and some people it's an underlying rage. So hostility and one of the things just to acknowledge this, and acknowledge the hostile part of it, Mary's used this part of the material in working with perpetrators of domestic violence. Because do you want to talk about that application a little bit, Mary? Sure. Um, well, <clears throat> my big thing working with uh, perpetrators of domestic violence was the pendulum, because my personal experience was I could use, I could notch down com compulsive highs when I was out of my head crazy. I could notch them down. So if you're out of your head crazy with anger, you can also learn to use the map of the pendulum to activate your thinking self and bring yourself down. Um, but part of the material life force that you can see in domestic violence and in sexual abuse, especially family sexual abuse, is that the people are an extension of your material life force and not your caring life force. So they're your, you know, as the perpetrator, they're your family, so they're your possessions and uh, that you have the right to use them or to beat them because your material life force is spilling out into an area which doesn't go. Now, you know the thing about the truth line? Well, that's one little slant on domestic violence. There's also the fact that uh, anything can be said that tri triggers shame and hurt from often being abused themselves that's so intense that they can't cope by doing anything than lashing out. So I'm not saying the pendulum and material life force give you the whole answer. Peter keeps saying there's no answers in the tools, but they are very uh, useful uh, in terms of uh, kind of understanding the situation. And you will find if you ever work in domestic violence uh, on either side, that the issue that sparked the violence is often the meal wasn't ready on time. It wasn't exactly how you wanted it. Um, the house isn't clean. You know, the, the concerns that trigger the, the, um, uh, the perpetrator, uh, you know, can be personal criticisms they can't cope with because it arouses toxic shame. But it's often that um, I can't cope with anything other than perfection and you're not being perfect, so I'm going to beat you up. So that's what came to mind when you asked yeah, that, Peter. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, in material life force, there's a sense of ownership. So, um, and you know, the parallels to slavery, of course, obvious. Uh, you know, you're not a person, you're property. I can do with you whatever I want whether that is sexual or simply phys or physical abuse, I can do with you or starve you. I can, you know, you're my property, I own you. Uh, similar dynamic, and, and this is one of the places where this can be a terrific tool um, because, you know, perpetrators of domestic violence have something, configuration something like that, 
the caring life force as I brush stroke called it the uh, on Wednesday um, love is it, sort of squeezed to nothing okay um, and what effective work with working with people of domestic violence in one way is finding a way to get there um, finding a way to expand their caring life for and there can be small steps well peter what, i just have to tell yeah. the story now you've said that so my longest work in domestic violence was in a group a low-cost group when i was just a student and they were ex-gang members and ex-alcoholics, and some of them had probably been in prison. And um, they would cry when they were talking about their past. Mm -hmm. And they would say, I've never had any male friends before. You know, they'd never talked about their feelings and been heard and listened to. So they went, wow, you know, these were the toughest guys. It didn't happen in the... Uh, other groups I was in so much, but this was a small group, and uh, th they really found their caring life force. And it probably, uh, I mean, they were already sober, uh, they already made changes, but it probably really changed their life that they found the caring life force. Yeah. And you know, if you go into the field, M Mary Stapleton worked in. Um, I don't know if you want to come in, or Mary. But, you know, you go to something like an AA meeting and, you know, you've got people who are just carrying life force all over the place who never had it before, um, who never had it before. Do you want to say anything about that, Mary? Just tell you that um, Clara was trying to get back in and I was trying to help her find the link, but she seems to be oh, having okay. trouble. So she's going to watch the recording. Let me just say that um, most of you probably know, but just recently uh, I started and Cynthia has been helping me with the recordings, a, a YouTube channel. You just put in Pellin Institute in the YouTube search bar. Click on the, some of these will come up, but click on the big P or the name Pellin Institute, and then you'll get to the full range of uh, what's available for introductory videos. And, um, and then as many as we've put up so far of these forums. And just incidentally, I was accidentally started Wednesday's one uh, when I was doing some admin work. And it was so interesting, I was listening to it because I was working on screen. And it was so interesting that when I finished my work, I turned off, uh, I turned onto video and I watched it right to the end. And that really surprised me because, you know, Peter's trained my listening. I often start to hear things again and I go, oh God, I remember what they're going to say. And, you know, I don't want to hear because I've kind of remembered too much. And I did remember some things, but it was just so interesting reviewing it again. And so I'm just encouraging people, you know, I certainly can go, oh, I've already heard that. I used to think that about Activator Film. Oh, I've already seen that. And went back and saw it recently and it just blew my mind. So it's like the other pen in things. Give it a chance to repeat, give it a chance to play, give it a chance to kind of take it in and absorb it. It's all, maybe it's significant that I started listening when I was doing something else. I wasn't paying full attention, but then it really caught my attention. So uh, that's just... Um, as director of communications, <laughs> just uh, encouraging you in that area, uh, arena, or whatever the right word is. Thank you. I think Mary wants to say something. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have got something Hi. to add. Um, Amongst the people that I worked with in drug rehab, who were, you know, were really keen on changing their lives around, but one of the great needs they had was for respect. Mm. Um, you know, you, you, and, and 
the part, a lot of the work they had to do was maybe letting go of some of that need for respect. Mm, yes, uh, yes. You know, it, that's only just sort of like come up for yeah. me, so I haven't. Yeah, no, it that fits. I mean, and again, these are tools that we apply in different ways. Um, and that population often has a lot of material life force. And one thing that material life, the recognition that people in the material life force need, you probably remember from training is respect. The recognition from performance life force is applause. The recognition from caring life force is acceptance. That state, straight day. Um, so they often have a lot of that, okay? And there's a certain there's a certain need to control in the material life force, okay? Because I need to know where everything is, you know. Um, there's a certain need to control. And of course that's where, you know, you're my child, I have to control you, you're my wife, I have to uh, control you. And you know, particularly the worst parts of sexual jealousy uh, come from material life force and they have that undercurrent of hostility in them. But there is, I think, what you're saying is sort of letting go of the control a bit, letting go of the need for respect and just being there. Just being there and expect and accepted for who they are regardless which is the caring life force. Oh, I just, I, yeah, yeah. I just, so I just want wanted to make like a quick political point about that because yeah. just like people say she's just a foster carer, you're just a foster carer, I feel very strongly that being, you know, I'm somebody that's overcome literally being crazy and being hospitalized, but I have such respect for anyone who comes off drug or alcohol and I do not see it in the general therapist population. I don't know about people who work in that particular field. I just have enormous respect for anyone who overcomes that. And I, and I, I think uh, that's under-recognized, just like foster carers' talent isn't recognized by the helping professions yeah. in general. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, as you can tell, this has been wonderful for me. Um, so the way we end, we just each say a name. I call on people because that seems to work. Um, and we just say a name and where we're located and um, you know, anything else we might want to say in ending up. And Can I please start because I've got to go and I still have Yeah, you go first, Victoria. Thank you very much. I'm Victoria, still in Paris. Talent Project Paris. Yes. Okay, I'll go next. I'm Peter. Uh, I'm in Norfolk in England. Um, yeah, thank you, Victor. I've got nothing more to say, but thank you so much. That's me. Do you want to go next, Victor? Well, thank you. I'm uh, my pendulum's here, <laughs> bro. I'm pretty emotional right now. I want you all to know that. So um, this is really, really important to me. Thank you so much. Uh, it's almost shocking in a positive way that you have your meetings Wednesday and Sunday because that's the way the activator unit ran. Uh, Peter, you did that on purpose. <laughs> I remember I, Wednesday night was the lectures and Pelham right, would just hammer up stuff right. and then we would have a discussion no, on Sunday. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> and uh, tell me now, uh, is it 2140 West 4th or 2150? Come on, I need to know. 2150 West 4th, right? Yeah. <laughs> he, he, I got you on that one, didn't I? You yes, see, that was did. the address of a unit, you know? Yeah. I live in Abbotsford. Very, very rarely I'll drive into Vancouver, but when I do, if I go by Fourth Avenue, I can tell you it tugs at me right there, you know. Yeah. But um, it's been very, very special to me. I will be uh, Sundays. I do have other things, but I'm gonna. I'd like to be, come back and join you all again. Uh, I'll, so I use the same link up, the same links to get in on, on Wednesday. Is that correct? 
This yes. is a Zoom meeting on Wednesday. Yes. Thank you. I'll do that. And um, once five minutes after I get out of this, uh, Mary, I will. I will. Uh, everybody didn't hear this, but shortly after David Pellin died, I wrote. Uh, please forgive me for getting emotional again, but I wrote a, an article for the Reader's Digest titled "The Light on Fourth Avenue," and I sent it to mm. the Reader's Digest. They declined it. But every once in a while, I share it with people. So Mary has asked that, that I'll send it to her uh, uh, within five minutes. Peter, I did give it to you a long time. Well, maybe I didn't, actually. Maybe I didn't ever give it to you. But I'll send it to Mary. And Mary, you can get it to people in the group if you'd like to. Is that OK? Very much. Yeah, so, and I'll be, uh, I'll be posting it on the, the Facebook group, not the Facebook page, which is Peter's yeah. teaching uh, page. But I, in the group, I'll be posting it. I can, I can, I, I can email it individually to, to people who are here today. I can't Thank imagine I'll have a problem with that since I wanted to get it published 45, 47 years ago. They didn't do it. <laughs> it should be okay. You know, thank you, folks. And I will see you again. Uh, I'm going to stay here until everybody else is gone or when the last person goes. Cause, and then because uh, I want to hear your remarks. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Mary Goleman. Uh, so I'm Mary Goleman in Rosarito Beach, Mexico. Uh, I'm just like really blown out by Victor coming to. It was very emotional for me, you know. Uh, I when I first started learning David Penn and you know through Peter learning David's pen and stuff, there were unfortunately now being lost a few typewritten papers, and the one I remember is about uh, vanity and uh, rejectedness of certain type of rela relationship, and. Um, Oh, it means a lot to me to hear those stories of such a new, you know, Peter changed my whole life and Pellin changed your whole life and Pellin, David Pellin changed Peter's life. So it's really amazing to hear those wonderful stories. Thank you so much for coming and giving them to us. Nikki? Wimbledon, London. Oh, I'm Nikki in Wimbledon, London, England. Um, Great to hear everybody, and um, I'll say again, oh, that made me cry, you know, just just the reaching back in time thing. It's amazing. <laughs> so thanks again for coming, Victor. Cease? Um, yeah, I'm Cease, Cecilia Yoakum, Tampa, Florida. Um, yeah, this was a great session. I was thinking about how these three forces that you talked about today also uh, play out in our society. And I think some of them have gotten to a toxic level, the mm. material, the performance, and um, the caring isn't at a toxic level, that's at a, a great level. But the, this, I think the performance and the uh, people having to show off that they can do things. I'm not just talking about the president, but other people. And then uh, the material that that we're all so aware of how the wealthy has gotten so out of hand. Yeah. And and so I think those are really important to look at, not just as individual people, but as a whole force in our society. Um, so it gave me a different perspective. So thank you. Thanks, Steve. Cynthia? Hi, um, I'm Cynthia. Um, I'm in Kankakee, uh, Illinois, um, which is about 40 minutes south of Chicago. Um, what I wanted to discuss, and, and actually I'm, I'm very happy to be hearing the stories, and I did watch the movie Activator One, and I wanted to express my gratitude for those, for Peter and for Mary and Victor, for the people who have kept this alive and everybody who kept this alive for so long. I wasn't even born at that time when, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't make people feel old, but I wasn't even born when, I, I was born a couple of years after, I was born in 1970. So um, when they were, when that was going on, but that still touched my life. I mean, I didn't even really know, but when, um, through Mary, um, when I was talking about being a lawyer, um, my business collapsed. Um, it collapsed in, it, a few years after the recession because it never mm -hmm. recovered. And also, mm -hmm. my energy wasn't into it. And I was, when you're talking about burning out from carrying life force, I saw some horrible things and, and that happened as well. Um, 
but when I was going through, I went through a terrible time, I was going through bankruptcy, but it was the tools, uh, Mary, particularly accepted and rejected efforts that Mary taught me, helped me get through that time and sort of rebuild and, and you know, take a few steps at a time to, to finish my practice without, you know, making sure all my clients were taken care of. Um, and, and I'm just so grateful that, that people kept something alive <laughs> that started from before I was born. And it's just, there's something very powerful in, in hearing that story. So I thought I'd share it. Thanks. Mary in England. Um, I'm Mary Stapleton from the South Coast of England. Um, I want to give my thanks to Victor as well for coming and joining us. Um, it, the the sense of continuity, I think, is very comforting. Um, and also the connection with Vancouver, because my son and grandson live there, and I know Kitsilano well. So, and so it gives me a sense of closeness with them as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Shelley, rounding up. Hi. I'm Shelley, I'm in Los Angeles, close to Topanga. I used to live in Topanga, <laughs> where Mary lives most of the time. Um, anyway, I um, enjoyed hearing everybody, and Victor was very inspirational, and it brought it more, you know, to life, um, that, you know, who Helen was, and how you guys learned so much from him, and really were motivated. So that was very inspiring, and I'm going to wish Victor well. For his son it must be heartbreaking to see his son in such a difficult place and um uh i'm gonna look forward to reading that article yeah on fourth avenue take care and uh, clara just wanted me to say she had internet trouble couldn't get back in but she wanted to say thank you okay the article second to go to mary all right yeah. thank I'll you for, i'll forward it yeah <laughs> well, thank you all very much, very, very much. And I'll see you on Wednesday. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.